get started by allowing our panelists to introduce themselves. So if want, someone wanted to grab the mic to start, I'm going to make Dr. Squitieri introduce himself first. Thank you, Joanna. Uh, I'm Ferdinando Squitieri. I'm a neurologist working on um, Huntington diseases since a, long, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of time. And uh, I would like to just state that, in my opinion, you are the expert. Okay, and uh, uh, whatever, what, <laughs> even, even if, of course, you will ask questions to us, but we need, and uh, all, all the time, every day, we learn so much from you. So that th this is important to state. Thanks, Nando. Uh, my name is Selene Capodarca. I am the Aurora HD uh, study Global Study Director, and I'm also a, a part of um, EHDN. I'm Olivia Handley. I'm the Enroll HD Platform Director and also part of EHDN. Hi, um, I'm Lauren Byrne. I am a HD researcher in UCL, um, and I'm a Huntington's Disease family member. Hi, my name is Carly. I'm from Wales in the UK, and I'm a young person impacted by HD. Hi, I'm Bonnie Hennig Trestman. I come from the United States. Many of you know me as Dr. Bonnie. Um, I am a clinician and a researcher, and I'm on the board of directors of HDO. I'm also the author of Talking to Kids About Huntington's Disease. And hi, I'm Astri Arnesen. I'm from Norway, and I'm an HD family member. My mother had HD, and my sister is in the late stage of the disease. And my brother passed away with HD a few years ago. So I've been lucky myself. I tested uh, negative uh, some years ago. But I'm also here because I'm the president of the European Huntington Association. So stay involved. Hello. Does that feel good? Is that good? Is that too far? Yes. That's good? Yeah. Is that too much? <laughs> oh, I'm man. Matthew, um, I'm the founder of HDO and also a family member. <laughs> kind of a big deal. And I'm not going to call him out too much, but uh, Lauren is also a board member at HDO, and it is... Not Ed Wild. I was supposed to be... You are. Yeah. You it are, was supposed to be Ed Wild here, but... Yes, and I didn't, I didn't mention that. So Ed, unfortunately, because of some strikes that were happening at the University College of London, is seeing patients this weekend because ev some appointments got switched over. So he's seeing HD patients. So Lauren is in his stead, but um, she's an amazing HD researcher, HDYO, and also um, she is the chief investigator all of, it. of Join Joe. HD. Oops. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> and Carly is also one of our amazing ambassadors. So uh, thank you all so much for being here. I'm going to open it up to our first question that we received, and it's a pretty straightforward question and one that we get a lot. Um, and so this question is essentially, how long are we out from having a drug available that can delay the symptoms and progression of Huntington's disease? <laughs> not, not, not that easy to answer. Um, it depends on, uh, of course, uh, basically two important things. The first is, all research uh, phases must be completed and the drug must be up, uh, must basically work. So it is proved that it is beneficial for the HD community. And the second important step is that the, authority, the regulatory authority approves that. So time line, timing and timelines depends on these two important steps. Then each country has a sort of a different negotiation between the pharma industry that is producing the drug and the, authority, the regulatory authority of that particular country. And of course, uh, many drugs for focused on rare disease uh, have some shortcuts to become available. So. Uh, f people for pharma industries are here, may eventually update what I said. I can add to that. Um, so I, w I wanted to highlight first about kind of expectations of 
delay onset, the slow progression and what the kind of current aim is of a lot of current programs and that are particularly the Huntington lowering things and maybe what the perspective of clinicians and, and doctors and scientists are of delay and per, de, symptoms are, might be different from what everyone in the room and someone who is potentially going to suffer Huntington's might expect. So um, I think we're relatively close in the next five years of perhaps having a drug that can slow disease progression, but what that means might look like someone's still getting worse within a trial. Um, it's not something that I don't believe we're really very close to having something that stops the disease in its tracks yet, but that's my personal opinion. Okay. Our next question is, I think an important one, especially with an international community. We tend to hear about Huntington's disease only in certain countries. This one specifically is how come we don't hear about HD in Africa? It's not talked about. Are there essentially locations where HD does not have a presence? Or are there countries where indeed there are more frequency of people diagnosed with Huntington's disease? So kind of a loaded question. Yes, so maybe I can start saying something about that because uh, that's definitely a, a big issue for us and we work very closely with the International Huntington Association and the community because Huntington's is everywhere. It's even in indigenous populations in Australia, in, in, in Greenland, and, and wherever there are human beings, there is HD, seems to be. Now, the prevalence can vary based on different factors, and we don't know, because for, Afri for Africa, for instance, we know so little. Uh, for big continents like India, we just start to get to know things more. For Egypt, a huge population, maybe they have very high prevalence in, in, in certain areas there. But we just start to discover these things and we need, we need to include all of us because that's also important for research because maybe there are small variances and differences that can bring added value to the research community when we have these populations more included into us. So we, we, I, I'm so glad that there are some representatives here from, from other parts of the world than, than us normal Europeans and North Americans. We are everywhere, but, but we really need to bring in. We are seven billion people on, the, on the, this earth. Yeah, yes, sure. I fully agree. Um, just uh, to, to remark that there are some places where we, we believe there are some kind of clusters we, we name uh, of the disease. For example, some that have been mentioned by Astrid Arneson, uh, some other uh, are, for example, in uh, everybody knows in Venezuela uh, and also in uh, some part of Australia and uh, we are aware that also in Italy we have some kind of places where we believe there are clusters with a particularly high prevalence of uh, patients and families and uh, for it concerns uh, Africa uh, and uh, all the Middle East area I would like to um, have a consideration on that. Uh, uh, of course, it is important to uh, perform a proper studies in those areas, like Astrid said. And, uh, uh, for example, we uh, got in touch with the Middle East population. Some of you know that very well. And uh, we learned that some mutations may immigrate from African places to Middle East and uh, this is influencing uh, uh, the prevalence of a country and might depend on a specific genetic background. So there is so much to learn and uh, the, the appeal and the, the recommendation is of course to be in strict contact with us to, to improve everything is in our chance to learn some more. Just a, 
add one thing, that just because we think that there is no prevalence doesn't mean that there isn't Huntington's disease, as both of you talked about. And I think that one of the things that we can all do is to, for people who are in countries that you don't have a, um, an association, is to start talking about this, because I think it's going to be a, about awareness and about feeling comfortable talking about this. There are some countries and places that do talk about this openly, and so people feel comfortable. So this can be cultural as well, and I think for us, it's very much going into those places to say, it's okay to talk about this. Um, and I think that that will help with some of this, you know, in terms of, it's not about prevalence, it's about people feeling comfortable and coming forward. Great, I think that's a really important, all of those are fantastic points, and I'm so glad that question was asked. Um, this is a little bit complex, I'm gonna break these questions up, but why would a drug like tetrabenazine not be available in some countries? So I think that's a bigger point, is what goes into the process of how drugs can become available once approved? I'm really sorry. It's a, it's a very, very, very hard question for me because I would like to rem re remember and remind to everybody that tetrabenazine is a specific indication for chorea. Tetrabenazine is not a drug for Huntington disease. It's a drug for choreic movements, first of all. So it is important not to abuse of tetrabenazine because uh, it is a symptomatic, a symptomatic treatment that with specific indications. So said, uh, tetrabenazine is uh, aware, is, is available, I guess, everywhere. Deu tetrabenazine is not available everywhere, uh, not in Europe in particular. Uh, I guess uh, that the side effects of the drug did not convince perhaps European countries or European uh, medicine agency that much. But I don't know whether uh, uh, people may add something more about that. There is no answer. I mean, it's a decision of European medicine agency. I think I can talk about things more generally, um, why there's differences. Um, each country and area have their own regulatory. So the, in the US, they have the FDA. The, um, and then in Europe, we have the EMA. Um, UK has MHRA. These are all different boards or bodies that will... Pro, um, market drugs and allow drugs to get approved for use. Then within each kind of country, they have their own medical systems and whether a, a, like the NHS, whether NICE will buy into a drug will, will depend on a lot of things like the cost of the drug, the benefit it is likely to cause patients and things like that. So it, it, it is really complicated. Um, there's a lot of reasons why drugs might not certain countries might not approve a drug. And I think in the instance of tetrabenazine, it might be perhaps perceived that it, it wasn't more, like the benefits compared to maybe tetrabenazine weren't strong enough to condone maybe a higher price or things like that. But I can't comment specifically on that. No, but I think we need to bring in on a general basis, it's of course the regulators and the country's authorities, but it's also the company what the company decides to do and where they apply for market access and of course how they negotiate the pricing to have it reimbursed. So there are always several stakeholders who are behind if it's made, made available or not. I think all of that is a good point for why advocacy matters. Mm -hmm. Because advocating for yourselves, going and talking to your government, Seth just chatted about having an FDA listening session. And that wasn't to say that the FDA is the only way to do this. It's saying this is how he approached it. So how can you take that back to your country? How can you work with your advocacy associations, your doctors, your local governments to continue to say this is what we need? So I think it's a very well-rounded um, approach that needs to be, to be addressed. Yeah, I think it's very important to have the advocacy to really communicate the worth to actual patients, um, which I don't think the, these agencies can do without, we need more voices um, from people that it's actually going to impact. 
Please do know, though, that for Korea, and as um, uh, Fernando had said, that it is for Korea. It, this is a symptom that is in other diseases besides Huntington's disease. So even if these drugs are not in your country, there are other drugs that can limit and, and decrease movements. So it's not all like, you know, we have to get this one drug. So and, and one drug that works for somebody is not necessarily going to work well or perfectly for another person. So this is a conversation to have with your healthcare teams as well as advocating for these, uh, these institutions institutions and, and uh, trying to get these drugs over. Great. So I think this is another great question coming up is how do we find resources and support, whether that is support groups, tangible resources, medical resources, if we live in a country that has few or none? How do they seek support? How can they seek support? <laughs> that was savage. Thank you, Ashtri. Um, well, you've always got a place at HDO if you're within the certain age range. <laughs> if not, then you need to go to EHA <laughs> or IHA. Um, but those, seriously, those are the places to go. Um, and that's exactly the reasons why, why places like HDO and, and EHA were set up, because there's a lot of people out there who, who are in countries where the infrastructure is just not there yet, and, and they need that support still. They need to you know, have, have questions, they want to be educated, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's very important. You want to add to that? I can give you my back if you want. Yeah, I just want to add to that because HDO is a fantastic organization where you can get in touch no matter where you are based. Huh? So that's, that's fantastic. And what we do also as, as the International Huntington Association is that we support you and help you organize yourself. Because we see, based on our experience here in Europe and in North America and, and, and where there are associations, associations, sorry, the situation improves because you get a formal way to raise awareness and to advocate for the needs and, and to have that dialogue with the healthcare system and the social support system. So, so it's really a tool to get organized and there is help to get support to get organized. And that's how we all started, one step at a time. And one or two people are, is enough to get started. So this is, oh sorry, Bonnie, did you have, okay. Uh, this is a little bit of a specific question, but an interesting one, that if a parent's at risk, making my risk level at 25%, and they were to pass away unexpectedly, is there a way for us to do any kind of post-mortem testing to understand what my genetic makeup may be? It's, uh, Where's Oliver? Depends on the country, correct, Oliver? Well, it depends on the regulations, um, and it depends on consent. Um, so, uh, obviously, the deceased parent cannot give consent. One second. Um, run, Ashley, run. I'm running, I'm running. <laughs> Yes, it will depend on the country, and of course I can only speak for uh, my own practice in the UK. Um, but basically, in times past, although perhaps not so, um, not so frequently now, we used to bank DNA specifically for that purpose and take that consent whilst the person was alive. Um, so the answer is sort of yes, you can. Um, Things have moved on, so I suppose the question I would have back is, why would you want to do that? I mean, I take the point that if the person, the parent doesn't have Huntington's disease, you don't have to go through a predictive test yourself. Um, yeah, that might be possible, but in a, in a small number of cases. So let's go a little bit more about getting involved with the community because I know that's a big part of what this Congress is going to be doing. So especially for our community members uh, on our panel, how do you suggest people start to get involved in the community? Um, well, my personal experience is that it's very impactful. So 
connecting with everyone here today, you probably guess, is impactful. Making friendships, relationships, just people who truly understand what you're going through is probably the most beneficial experience for me personally and probably many other people sitting here. So getting involved in the community for me is the, the best thing I've done. I know not everyone finds that best for them, but I think the more you can get involved in the community, the more you're going to meet everyone and, and feel connected and feel that kind of family and relationship and support is, is the main thing. Having that support from people who understand is, is definitely going to help everyone. Carly, what was your experience in coming to the, the knowledge that you wanted to, to get involved with the community? How did you start that process, um, and uh, where did you find those resources? Uh, probably started when I myself went through genetic testing. Um, prior to that, I was probably not, not that I didn't want to, but the genetic testing process really pushed me over to that side. Um, so yeah, like two years ago when I went through genetic testing, I, I kind of realised that lack of support and the lack of anyone around me being able to understand what I was going through. And yeah, anyone who has been through genetic testing, whether it's positive or negative, has probably experienced that really tough experience of just being alone or no one there. And yeah, it's definitely a passion of mine to, to push that and close that gap of not having that support, which is, yeah, definitely needed. So that's what pushed me to be involved. Um, HDO were my go-to, and I couldn't thank them enough for being there. Um, and I, yeah, I don't think I'd be a, sitting here today without them. So I appreciate Matt and Jenna for that, and everyone in the audience. I I'll let the applause end because she deserves it. But that was, uh, yeah. I mean, Carly's just. Uh, you know, perfect example really of, you know, a young person just being brave and taking it does take a lot of courage, you know um, making those steps, coming to this event, you know, when you've not been to much at all, I'm talking to all of you that's brave, it takes a lot of courage to do it, so, and then it's the same thing here with Carly getting involved in things, it takes courage if every single step of the way, you have to kind of say okay, let's do this you know, because things will be better you know, you know things will be better when you're getting involved, you're involved with everything, but you've got to make those steps and, and that's kind of like, comes down to your courage, you know, and just try to, try to be brave, try to say hello to everyone and try to say, what can I do, you know, yeah, that's all I got. And I think it is steps, I mean, it is steps, you're not going to make this big leap and just jump right into the ocean, you're going to kind of walk a little bit and utilize your resources and your support group around you to continue to go a little bit deeper and a little bit deeper for whatever you feel like is the best for you. Lauren, did you have something? I was just going to add kind of, yeah, getting tested was probably my start and coming to events where I heard people like Charles Sabine, Sarah Winkless and people talk had a huge impact on me growing up in a although I was lucky my parents talked to me and I knew about Huntington's my whole life there was still this kind of there's no point getting tested there's nothing we can do about it just live your life um and it was just nice to experience people that saw things differently um and it wasn't until after I got tested and got into research that I actually got involved in actually the general community and it's been kind of life-changing for me um like I, I remember my life before when you just didn't talk about it and you didn't get that support and now I, I'm surrounded every day by people that understand it and it's just really healing and that's a good point because nobody in this room is anybody you have to explain Huntington's disease to right and no one's going to say well your parent or your child or your sister or your brother doesn't look like they're sick there's, there's no judgment here. And I think in terms of really small steps, I think the first step, as Matt said, is you are here. So you're already doing this. If you want another step, make it a concrete step. Say for later today, can you introduce yourself to two new people today who you haven't said hello to, right? Can you make it really concrete and set, a, a bound, set something for yourself to say, and tomorrow I'm going to introduce myself to five new people, just to say hello. That's all you need to do to, do, to start this. 
And do know also in terms of this, we t I've talked to a lot of people here, and there's all this motivation, and there's all this um, uh, energy, and it's anxiety and energy. So, you know, we're all going to thinking we're going to go home and we're just going to change the world and also, you know, do, do things different in our countries. Please do know, and this is not a, a downer, but it's just a realization that is there is a post-conference slump. So for you know people who are shaking their heads that they know when they go to some of these conferences, there's so much energy behind this, and you're like, I'm going to go home and I'm going to do all of these things. Real come the, done. Huh? Yeah, th there's a realization that all of a sudden you're not getting up that next day and going to a conference and seeing all these people. That's okay. So if you don't come to my self-help uh, talk on tomorrow, I'm giving you a little bit of a preview. Make a plan to say that you're going to connect with people. Before you leave tomorrow, say in a month, can we do a Zoom meeting or can we FaceTime or can we text? Make those connections and, and try to see if you can connect and, and create an event or something that you're going to talk to somebody, not just say, hey, we'll, we'll talk. Think about setting something on a calendar for maybe even in a couple of weeks or a month so that this can continue without that post-conference uh, slump, which is going to happen, but also that you're not setting yourself up to say, someone's going to reach out. Don't expect somebody else to reach out. You reach out. Great. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, also, just to add as well that um, from this community, I think as Nando explained at the beginning, just being able um, from the researchers, there are a number of young researchers, um, and this is the first type of meeting that they have attended. And I think um, the, the the welcome and the encouragement that the research community is offered to join these meetings and the things that we can take away and the um, relationships that we can build on in sort of now and in the future is just so invaluable to us. And and, um, and the amount that we can learn from that is, is hugely informative. So I think that's a, a really useful and positive um, aspect of the community that HDO and all of the associations have helped bring together. Okay, now we're gonna get another, uh, another twist of it. So I'm nervous about joining studies and enroll HD. Can you tell me about what the benefits are and what to expect? Okay, maybe we can split the answer in two parts. What do I do if I'm nervous and what are the benefits? Because I think they are related, but perhaps not so much. So if you're anxious about taking part, and I, I mainly speak about a role. So if you're anxious about taking part um, in a role, just ask questions, ask your uh, clinician, um, go to the sites, ask as many questions you, um, as you have, and uh, if at the end of that, so obviously there is a whole informed consent process uh, that is uh, taking place. If at the end of that process you're still anxious, don't do it. You don't have to take part until you're comfortable. So that, I think that's the key message. Uh, but then perhaps, um, and I don't know, Nanda, if you want to share your experience with uh, uh, some of the participants, that perhaps after they had their answer, uh, their question answered, then they, they were, com like, they took part and they, they kind of, uh, that kind of anxiety went. So I think that's, that's one part of the question. Um, and then the other aspect is, you, uh, they were asking about the uh, benefits. So in terms of uh, individual benefits, and I'm speaking mainly about their role, um, individual benefits, I think a role is a, is a nice way of getting into research. Um, is a relatively, in terms of assessments, is a relatively non-invasive, in fact, it's a non-invasive um, uh, way of kind of getting familiar with the research setting, uh, getting back to um, the regular appointments, uh, uh, getting familiar with some of the assessments that are then also used in, in some of the trials. So I think it's just a way of getting into that kind of research um, environment. Um, as, as I've mentioned this morning in the uh, presentation, is also um, an as way of having continuity. So it's a long, it's an open-ended study. So um, you will kind of be followed year after year. Um, and then in terms of, so that's in terms of individual benefits, but in terms of uh, the, what the community then benefits, I think that's the real kind of wealth and the, the biggest benefits. You have seen all the things that we, um, the, the research community has achieved this morning in the presentation. So I think, I would, I think that's the main benefit. It's not so much for the individual, but it's for the whole, it's for the whole community.
Celine, what we also sometimes say for people is that Enroll HD is the waiting room for clinical trials. I think that's a nice right? way of putting so, it. And the way I look at this is if you, sometimes if you want to get into a really good restaurant and you get on a waiting list, okay? So you get on the, on the waiting list for this restaurant and then they can call you to say that there's a, a table ready. But you don't have to take that table, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So you have, it's all um, uh, de-identified. So Olivia talked about that today and all of the numbers, you know, so that they don't, you, um, the researchers, the, the people in your healthcare setting know who you are and say, oh, this number came up and they're eligible for this study, so I'm going to call them and ask them. And you can say yes or no. I want this or I don't want it. So I think that that's an amazing benefit because they enroll people. You don't know who was called and who wasn't called, Absolutely. but your doctor will say, there's a study here that's available for you. Do you want to? I'll give you all the information, the consent. We can talk about this. Or maybe I'm going to send you to another state or another country even for this, but it's the waiting room for other clinical studies. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a nice way of putting it. The, the other uh, benefit that uh, it may be worth to mention is that um, participating in a role may provide some visibility when clinical trials are coming up. Um, I do want to highlight that that's not the only way of getting into clinical trials, so that's, it, it, I really want to like, make that clear, uh, but it does provide some, some visibility when, when the uh, site is running clinical trials. Did you want to add that? If you I, 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 I can add one. just in the perspective of both being someone who takes part in it as a participant, but also sees a lot of patients and have done and role as a uh, person who takes consent and does the cognitive testing. And um, I think it goes back to something similar I said about finally being part of the community and being surrounded by people that get the disease. So I can't speak for every site, but um, when you come to specialist HD centers, they tend to be people that really do get the disease more so than your average doctor or people that you've come in to um, contact maybe the outside of that. Um, and it, it generally is a nice experience, I think, to, to be able to talk to people that understand it and get it. And you can ask them about updates and research or, or what's happening in the community. Um, and people make it, they're kind of, oh, it's a yearly catch up and it, it, it can be a really nice experience. Um, um, so I think I, I know from my experience with my participants, they generally enjoy coming to see us and we have a relationship and you see the same people every year. Um, so there, it, it can actually be fun. <laughs> Just one last thing to add is that we, we do encourage people to come back on an annual basis, but if for any reason that next annual visit isn't possible, it's entirely okay that that visit is missed. And then you will be contacted again for the next annual visit after that. And if the same thing happens and it has to be missed, it has to be missed. And you can always talk to the site and say, it's just not a good time. I'm just going to pause, and I'd like to come back and rejoin in the future. Um, so making sure that you're aware that there is that flexibility within your participation. And at the same time, if at any point you just want to stop, you can just withdraw. You don't have to give any reason or explanation. It doesn't affect the quality of care that you will continue to receive. But that is completely your choice. Yeah, just one more thing for myself. Uh, I've been in doing a role for before it was even a role. It was a registry before that, but it's 10 or 15 years, I guess, now. Uh, I go every year um, to my local site, which is Birmingham, um, and it sort of echoes what, what Lauren was saying there about you get to know your, your clinicians and, and their team very well, because you get that time with them you know, once a year, and it's not, you know, you don't have, that's a commitment, and it's good, you know. Um, it's nice, I don't want to be there more than that. But that's nice to come in once a year and say hello and have a chat. And it feels like that, you know. Um, and I actually go um, on the same day as my wife usually goes. She goes, she's a control. And she, she loves to chat. So she's, <laughs> her appointment takes two hours and mine takes about 30 minutes. Because <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, 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 sure. And I go through and I'm done. But um, I mean, so it's, it's really nice to have that connections and it does give you the opportunity to then take part in other things. And, and I have had my clinic contact me and say, this is coming up and, it, and it, you're in that criteria um, and do you want to be involved? So it does, does really help in that benefit. Um, I would say the only the kind of 
thing to consider if you're a young person is really just how you feel about it. Like, because taking part, if you, I don't know if they were in the in your presentation earlier, but taking part, you know, you, you, you kind of question yourself when you're taking part and you can feel a bit like you want to maybe have a little of a chat afterwards that session. Um, it just kind of depends how you are as a person. Um, you, and you shouldn't really question yourself, but because the, you know, but it just, you, or everyone does it, you know? You're like, oh, did I do better or worse than last year? You do it every single time. Uh, <laughs> but you just have to kind of just go past that, you know? Because it's just, it's kind of negative energy that you don't need. So just, just remember the positives of taking part and that it's really helping everyone else and yourself as well, so, yeah. And I think too, as people um, take that step forward and wanna participate in research, and this is an observational study, and there are also other observational studies that you can participate in because we know that um, Enroll is not available in every single location. But also, you may just not be ready, but things like surveys, again, plug in for the HDYO survey because we want to know how you all are looking for resources. That makes a big impact, too. And so, I know, they're laughing at me like, get a plug that in. I did. Um, but Do we it. all, <laughs> as I mentioned in our virtual booth for, for other research opportunities, we have a link to the registry in Australia. We have some links for resources in the US for Change HD. So we do our best as a community to continue to provide that information. So you can do a lot of those from the comfort of your own home. And that also makes a difference. So keep that in mind as well. OK, so we have, uh, let me see. OK, yeah. Sure. Stop run, making run. me run. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Dina. Um, uh, I know a lot of people here don't know, um, but I just want to make a comment that has actually a perspective that hasn't been shared from the panel, and that, that is, so I'm a mother of two um, at-risk children, and I am gene positive. I have gotten involved with everything and anything, and everybody who knows me knows. I can knows. vouch for that. <laughs> <laughs> that has been my path and how I have dealt with it. But my boys have not chosen that, mm -hmm. and nobody should feel pressured to get involved with anything mm -hmm. if Absolutely. they don't feel that they need. If you do, then it's great, because this is the fabulous, it's the best community, the best support group, the love that's felt between everybody, I would say everybody should be part of it. But if that's not your journey, then nobody should be pressured into, into think, thinking, oh my God, I need to be part of the study, I need to be part of this. Uh, so I just thought I'd throw that in. From a parent who has two boys who have chosen not to be, they support me fully in everything I do, but they live their lives at risk, and they live their lives to a full. Thank you for that, Dina. Really important message. <laughs> so we have uh, some community members here who have gone through genetic testing, and it's always a really important and personal decision on why you decide to go through the testing process. I'm wondering if um, whomever, and all three or a couple, whatever you feel comfortable with, could you share some of the deciding factors for why you decided to get go through testing? I can start. Um, I think I touched on it a little bit um, before, but um, I had an experience from being a teenager and as I got older and, and experienced people that had been tested and were advocates that, that had a huge impact on me. Um, I was also into science and into brains and it became increasingly, <laughs> yeah, I got to see a brain be dissected when I was 16 and asked the doctors, which part of the brain is Huntington's? And she showed me and I was like, oh, and then light bulb and five years later, I'm doing neuroscience or neurology um, course in Queen Square. Um, but I never planned to get into Huntington's research. It's one of those things that just happened. And every I did a biology degree, and every 
project I picked had a relevance to Huntington. So I was like, maybe I should probably think about doing this, <laughs> really. Um, and I was in uh, London at the time and her discovered Sarah Tabrizi, if anybody's heard of her. Um, she's kind of a big deal. Um, but she was very inspirational as a woman and she happened to be at a, a London university. And I was like, okay, I need to get to UCL. I need, that's where I need to be for my master's. Um, and on my year out in my undergraduate degree, I also discovered who Jeff Carroll was. Who, if anybody doesn't know who Jeff Carroll is, who are you? Um, <laughs> where have you been? Um, but he is um, someone who carries the gene and is a, a major Huntington's disease scientist as well and researcher. And um, so I, I discovered him and, and emailed him at the time. Like, I'm thinking about HT research, but I've got the I'm at risk, and but I, I really am thinking more and more getting tested. And he, God love him, sent me lovely emails back. And I've met him since entering the community, and we laugh about it now. But um, that kind of was my journey. So I came back from a year abroad and decided I was going to start the process. Again, I never made a dis definitive decision. I just started the process like one step at a time. Um, got the referral, started the process. I was probably the most knowledgeable <laughs> for um, on like the science and biology and uh, kind of reasons that my genetic counselor probably came across. Um, and I, the, for me, the, the counseling made me more, every session made me more certain that I wanted to go for it. And I had that, once I made the decision, I felt relief. Um, which I think is always a, a thing for me. If if you make a decision and you do, and you feel calm after it, that's usually the right decision for you. Um, but I did it in secret from my family because I felt my mom couldn't deal. I didn't want to have to support her through that. Um, she was already having a tough time with my dad, and I knew they would try and discourage me. And I wanted to do the make it my decision and and something for me. Um, so, yeah, I, w I don't recommend doing it without um, having support, but it was definitely the right decision for me at the time. I did tell friends, and I made a lot of steps to support myself. I wrote letters for both outcomes. I was really not great for my gene-negative self, which is um, weird because I ended up being gene-negative, but I, it's actually my letter to my gene-positive self that I still look back on that gives me a lot of support and showed how much kind of love and support I gave myself through that time. So I'm going to move on because that's going to make me cry. <laughs> wow, I don't know. I'm going to follow that. <laughs> um, for me, genetic testing was always something I wanted to do, but I wanted to do it at the right time. I was in the kind of mindset that I knew anyway, and I think it just gave me that relief to just have it and know and most people say knowledge is power and it just kind of helped me move forward in myself um yeah i went through the genetic test and then kind of done it in a slow way maybe similar to you lauren um and then i don't know i've kind of did all of that and it was it was really helpful the, the process i felt really supported um sadly i kind of went through that and realized the lack of aftercare support, which was a shame, um, which has kind of put me into a new kind of career path where I want to close that gap and help other people following their genetic test result. So I'm trained to be a psychotherapist now. Um, but the actual process was, I felt supported and it was the right decision for me. Unfortunately, I did test positive. However, I'm glad I know when I have that relief like you. And yeah. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So, uh, because I think it's it's really good to hear these stories, and they're extremely valuable. And I also think, like Dina, it's really important to keep that position at risk uh, up, because most of the people coming forward in the community, or many of us, have tested. So there are not so many openly, you know, being at risk and, and, and on the podium here. And I think for me, I was at risk for 30 years, from I was 18 till I was 48. And, and that te when I was 48, it was the right time for me because our oldest daughter told me she needed to know 
And I said, okay, then I will do the test because you shouldn't have that burden done on you. So that was the right time for me. But I have good friends in the community and they are even older than me who are still at risk at an active choice because for them it's the right choice. So as a community, it's really an important message to keep. At risk is, is fine. It's fine. Nobody should feel pushed to do anything. You go your own process and you test if you get to the right time and if it never comes, that's also fine. That's just my message, I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely agree with that. Yeah, 100% on that. 100% is, is completely personal choice. And that's one of those kind of crazy things about Huntington's disease is that, like, you know, there's no right or wrong when it comes to genetic testing with Huntington's. It's just, like, it's what you want to do. And when if it feels right to you, then, then go for it, you know. Um, for myself, yeah, I was, I was like, I got tested when I was 19. Um, I just, I'd known I was at risk for several years, but hadn't really thought about it um, that much at all, but suddenly just felt like I wanted to know. And so I just, just told my family, yay, I want to know, I'm going for it. And that's what I did, started it. Um, for me, the process, the genetic counseling process was good, but also um, I found it a bit repetitive um, because they're just kind of checking every time that you still want to go through with this process. And that's, that's, that's the whole point of it. But um, I kind of felt like I already knew I wanted to go for it. So I just felt kind of, at that age, I just felt like I was wasting my time because I was just, you know, a bit immature at that age, of course. Um, some would say still a little bit. <laughs> you, you, got, got, you beat me to it. <laughs> I got it. Look, I just saw her with the mic there, you know. Um, so yeah, so uh, and then yeah, yes, you know, test positive, and and um, but one of the things for me was I wanted to use it as motivation, you know, like at that point in my life, I was doing nothing at all, um, and I wanted to do something, and I didn't know what, but I just used it. Okay, if I test positive, I'm going to try and do something with myself, for myself, and just you know get myself out there, push myself, um, and that's what I've been doing, and also it was for. Uh, for family reasons, for the future, if you know, for family. Because um, for us, uh, I didn't want to have a, a child at risk, and I knew that, um, fortunately, in, in this country, we have a, we get PGD, IVF, um, which, if you guys are not aware, I, I can't explain it to you right now. But, <laughs> but it's, um, you know, it's an option that's not always available uh, in some countries. But, but we got three attempts for free, and I, and I wanted to, that was something that we wanted to do anyway, and, and so uh, we were fortunate enough to have a, have a, a little boy now who's, who's not at risk, so that's great. Um, and that was one of the reasons that I wanted to do it, was also the, that family planning future, thinking ahead. Can I just add to that, um, you don't need to get tested to do BGD IVF, and that's one thing I tell everybody who's considering getting tested because they want to have children. I don't think that should be the reason you get tested. I think it should be your reason to get tested when you're ready and it's the right for you. I don't think you should rush into it because you suddenly are at the age you want to have kids. So both my brother and sister are at risk and have children that are HD free because they've done that. Um, it depends obviously where you are and what availability, but in the UK at least, they, my sister was able to get her, she miraculously got four embryos. Out of, I don't know how it happened because it's not normally that easy. So sorry for anyone who goes through the process. It's not the, it's not the fun way to have children, all right? Um, <laughs> but it's the thing that moved me is my sister, after she had her kids and she said, I didn't even realize what I was doing. Now that I have the children, I can look at them and they're HD free. It's just everything. And um, so she did it and was very lucky, but I, I absolutely, again, that's a personal choice if you want to have children that way. It's not pressure to do it that way, but just know what, what your options are. Yeah. If you are at risk, um, I want you to consider something. Why can't I get through this stuff without crying? <laughs> Love you, Bonnie. <sighs> Consider something. I hear, Lauren, I hear your story, and I understand that you wanted to protect your mom and all of that. If you are thinking to yourself, when I go through this, I'm gonna go through this alone because I don't wanna burden anybody. I don't want to um, 
bring anyone on this journey. I don't want to do this to other people. I want you to consider thinking about talking to those people before you get tested and saying to them, we all know I'm at risk. Would you like to be part of this journey or not at that time? Because what you are doing at that point is taking the burden off of you because you will talk to people in this room and Seth, I will point you out, you know, this is really motivated by, by his journey um, and, and we kind of jived when, you, when we first met that if you meet somebody who says, you know, I was gonna find the right time afterwards to tell my family I was positive or negative or whatever it was. There is never a right time. There's always gonna be a time. There's always gonna be a, maybe a better time, but there's never always gonna be the perfect time. If you can consider saying to yourself, I'm gonna take the burden off of me and I'm gonna give the control back to that person. That is a gift that you can give to that person because then you will know that they want to know or that they don't want to know. And then you can talk to them about, you know, what do you want to be, how do you want to be part of this journey? Do you want to go with me? Do you want to come with me? Do you want to uh, hold my hand? Do you want me to tell you later? Do you not want me to tell you? If you don't want me to tell you, but my cousin wants to, to know and you're their mother, how are we going to deal with this? Talk about this before you go in. Please do not do this alone. And I, you know, I mean, you might be able to be somebody who says, and I know Lauren got support from other people, but please at least consider this. I'm not never, if you talk to me, going to tell you what to do, but I want you to at least consider this as a possibility that you can speak to people before your journey. Yeah, I, I just would add that definitely have support and ha tell somebody it doesn't have to be your family, though. Um, I don't regret not telling me. Although I do look back, what I don't know really what my plan was if I tested positive, because I don't know when I would have told them. Um, but the best news, it was better telling my mum that I was negative than finding it out myself. I still have the picture of her, her face. But, but yeah, I still don't think I, wouldn't, I would do it the same. Because um, I know what my... I know what my mom is like and my sister and they would have tried to convince me not to and I just don't think that's fair and um, it should be your decision. And really, really quickly, um, just a quick plug too because we did talk about IVF and PGD. We are having a family planning session later today. So if you're not familiar with, that, with what that is, um, um, if you're not familiar with what that is uh, you, and what choices are, uh, Dr. Kelly Atkins is going to be talking about that. Um, Bonnie, I think this is a really good time. Uh, this question has come up, too, and it's a good reminder. And we've chatted a little bit about this, but attending events like this and hearing these stories can be really overwhelming because of everyone's personal journey. Bonnie, can you do a quick just update on how people, I know you're, you're talking about self-care tomorrow, but while people are at Congress, what are some of your tips for how they can maybe take a breather if they need to and what resources are available? Yeah. And um, is Ashley still here? Can you run a, um, a microphone up to the top? Um, so I think it really is important. You know, we all, I guess the, the term Christian is FOMO. Do you guys still use FOMO, fear of missing out, right? Okay. So the way I can explain this to you is I love to travel. And when I go traveling, and in the past when I've traveled, I create this agenda that I'm literally booked every single minute of the day. Um, you know, like I just remember dragging my mother through, you know, the streets of Paris and running her up and down. I mean, like, it's like 15 minutes, we gotta do this, we gotta do that. And at the end of a week, you know, first of all, we were exhausted, but it's kind of like, it was a smorgasbord. It was just a little tiny tapas, depending on which country you come from. A little tapas of everything instead of this experience. So now, and I love to travel with my husband, you know, we decide, are we just going to roam the streets? Are we just going to do something that we don't have to hit every single major highlight? Because just to check off that box to say I was there, is that really gonna do it for you? So here, even though it's only a couple of day conference, if you need to walk out that door and just declutter, do it. I really encourage you. There's always going to be uh, information on the web. All of these sessions are taped. You will always be able to reach out to pretty much any of the healthcare experts and each other to be able to connect. It is more important for you to take care of your mental health than to say, I need to be at every single 
session, I need to ask every single question. I need to, to absorb everything. Right now, especially for the people who haven't been, you're a sponge. You want to just do everything. But it is going to take its toll on the other side. So allow yourself permission. As you'll hear me say, I'm pretty much giving my talk, talk to yourself <laughs> as if you were somebody you loved. If somebody came up to you and said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, why don't you take a second? Why don't you go for a walk? Why don't you just try to you know, declutter your brain a little bit so that you can make more space there? Talk to yourself as if you're somebody that you love and take some time. If you are somebody who needs a couple of minutes, you will actually be better on the long run in terms of that. We will fill you in. There will always be an answer for you. You can always come up to somebody. But once you're there and over that hump where you're like, you can't, we can't get you back, it's much, much harder to do. There was a question up there. Yes. Hello. Um, I'm going to keep this very brief. Um, I'm trying you know, explain everything as quickly and succinctly as possible. So in 2012, I stopped seeing my dad in London. Um, I'd moved to Edinburgh when I was four uh, with my sister and my mother because uh, my parents divorced. Um, I didn't know why he was ill or what he was ill with. Ten years later, um, I see him again for the first time uh, is in 2014. Oh, not 10 years later, obviously. That doesn't add up. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, a couple of years after that, um, you know, I'm trying to still kind of process things. Um, and then when it came to 2012, my apologies. Um, so that's the 10 years later. Um, I find out that I either might or have it or not have it. I'm at risk. Um, I decide there and then that I wanted a test. Uh, I then saw my dad in 2014. It was pretty traumatizing. Um, he was not well. And, uh, and then in 2018, he died. Um, and it took me till 2016 to find out whether I had it or not. It took eight months of tests. I'm pretty sure that anyone who's gone through this experience um, realizes the pressure, the anxiety, the burden, and the weight of this. Um, it took eight months, an hour a month, to prove I was sane. Jump through their hoops. Just take a fucking blood sample. Sorry, excuse my French. And I want to try and ask how we can streamline this process. Uh, how do we make the NHS not drag out this already quite difficult um, situation, you know? Because I found out that I had it. Um, I'm cool with it. It's my life. I live it. It's okay. No one else has it. That's good. You know, and it's made me change my parameters and rethink my life, you know? So how do we streamline this process and make it easier for the people involved, whether they want to be involved or not? I Thank you. I would just like to comment first. Um, there's a reason why I, I can I completely understand why it's frustrating when you really decide already that you want to know. But the reason why you have your at least your two to three sessions, and I think Oliver can answer a lot of this as a geneticist in the NHS. Um, I come, my cousin um, found out, was one of the first people to get tested back in 96 and found out on the Friday he had Huntington's and committed suicide on the Sunday. So there is a reason why they draw it out and they it, it painfully find out wh what you're at. So maybe perhaps because so much trauma had happened to you in the years coming up to when you decided to get tested, there might have been more they might have been harder on you or to, to get that. I can't comment because I, I don't know your experience, but I just want to caveat that they're not drawn out to, to hurt you or, or, or cause you more problems. It's just to make sure you're ready. Um, how we assess that is up for question. Maybe Oliver has a comment. Well, I've got a, got a few comments. Um, speaking, oh, oh, the lady on the front's gone. Um, but talked about um, not everybody wants a predictive test. Now, we did uh, in our study, which is obviously UK-centric, it was about, we, we thought about 18% of people who are at risk choose to be tested. Now, if you go to different studies, you'll get, you'll, you'll get a different answer. But basically, uh, from what we can work out, the majority of people do not want to be tested. Um, speaking to your point, I'm sympathetic to it, but of course, um, I can remember when predictive testing uh, first became a, a reality. Um, so back then, uh, the concern was that we needed uh, at least two counselling sessions a month apart, which is what the guidance says. Um, 
uh, because we thought that we would be helping people to make the decision to be tested. But it doesn't, turns out that in reality, well, that does happen now and again, but in my experience, the vast majority of times, the person has come already decided that they wanted to be testing. They've gone through that, should I be tested, should I not be tested, before they've come to see us. Um, depending on how long you've been in the community, you will know that there's a process because you'll have heard about it and just accepted. If you find out that you're at risk for the first time, um, that can be a difficult conversation because whilst you might think that this is the right decision for me, um, and, and obviously it was, uh, <laughs> sure, but from my perspective, on the other side of the table, I'm thinking, hmm, just found out about it, hasn't had, t hadn't, hasn't had enough time to be at risk to know whether it is the right decision. So there is an element and a deliberate element of slowing it down. Now, now some people clearly resent that, but that's where we are at the moment. Now, I'm hopeful that that whole situation will change because as soon as we have a treatment that alters the natural history, all, you, all those guidance needs to be rewritten. So I can empathize on both sides, on your point that it was your decision, you'd made it, you'd come to the clinic, that's what you wanted, and you didn't want all, 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 all the surrounding counseling. Uh, on the other hand, I can sympathize with the counselors that said, hold, hold on, are we sure that this is the right thing? Um, so I'm hopeful that those guidance will change, but that's the situation at the moment. I just want to also add that in different countries, the testing protocols do vary. So I just want to let people know who are at risk that that is not, there's no norm, okay? So when I test people, it can be one or two, and they can get their results in like six weeks. So it's very different, and you just have to really talk to, I don't want this to, to you know, my, the way we do it is very different than the way that Great Britain does. So please, if you are at risk, don't be like, oh my gosh, I'm not gonna do that because. Talk to your testing centers. So you might go to different centers within your country if it's a resource, if it's available. But please do know that if you are interested, just pick up the phone and ask questions. You don't even have to give your name. Sometimes I get messages from people, they don't wanna give me their name. That's fine, I'll talk to you. Um, so talk to your testing centers and just say, I wanna find out information. Is there anything we can do for countries that don't have access to testing? Because I know after being in um, Colombia for Factory Itch, it's not openly available for every country. I, I think I met someone from Oman that had difficulties getting tested in there. Um, I, I maybe Ashley can talk more about this, but there's obviously huge health inequities around the world. Um, and... Yeah, I think that's it. it goes back to that question of is there <laughs> Huntington's in other countries? There definitely is, but we don't know the prevalence because we don't actually have, not every country has the infrastructure. No, no, definitely there are huge variations in access and procedures in quality. In quality, not all counselors are great. Many are, but not all. So it's, it's about finding those who can support you the way they do. I have just one advice in terms of, of doing the test or not doing the test or how to do it. It's be a little bit patient with yourself. Give yourself time. Because the day you have the response to your genetic test, you can never go back to where you were. So I have a good colleague, a friend in the community, and she says, going through the genetic test doesn't inform you. It transforms you. You change. And you should be prepared. And that's a process. Yeah. I, I want to, uh, sorry, and just in the, do you have one last statement? I was just going to add that, you know, we, we prepare so much for the gene positive result. I did not prepare enough for yeah. a gene negative result. And for someone who made Huntington's a real driver for my kind of viva <laughs> results, but um, testing negative took a whole toll of like, well, who am I now? and what is my identity now and and you will get treated differently because now you're not at risk now you're not positive you're mm. not part of the club and that's uh, unfortunately you know there that is the reality mm. 
I don't need to to add much more uh, to what you everybody said, and I, I fully agree with Oliver that, of course, uh, it takes time and uh, it's, it's a, a, a quite complex process, and we need to be very careful with the counseling processes. You know, I, I, we have been talking of it, but just a quick, quick, very quick comment, just to remark once again that even in these situations, enroll HD may help. Because, for, ex for example, all people with unknown conditions are helped by Enroll HD because it is uh, an opportunity to break the wall of the fear uh, through this kind of uh, procedures, in my opinion. Just to uh, add to what you said there at the top there, because um, you know, I went through a similar kind of thing in terms of like Oliver said, you hit the nail on the head for myself. You know, I already had made that decision when I got to the genetic counselor. I already knew I wanted to know. And so every appointment for me felt like a bit like Groundhog Day, where they were asking me the same questions every time. And it was a bit frustrating at the time. I was, like yourself, frustrated. But um, I now kind of understand that, hey, you know, it, it was a means to an end and they were there to sort of just safeguard us, you know, from ourselves in a little bit. Um, and it's still your, your decision, your process to go through. And they're there just to advise you. So, um, but in a way, we're also quite fortunate that we have this service in our country because, as people have said, the genetic, genetic counselling in other countries is very, very different. And sometimes you don't have access to anything or you might just be able to go onto these bloody, you know, these online things where you just, yeah, 23 and Me and those kind of things and just get it in some really odd and weird ways which you just don't want to go down those routes. Um, so we, it's, it's not perfect what, what we have, but it, it's pretty good um, as it is. And, and, but I don't know if we can make it better um, at the moment, it's difficult to say because it varies. Some people, as Oliver said, you know, you should have a minimum of two appointments. And, but I had six or seven. Um, and I was, so it's difficult to say. A month or uh, No, just, yeah, every, once a month, yeah. So I was, I was in the process for about six or seven months, yeah. Yeah. And it was frustrating. It could have been shorter for me. I felt ready. But also I was, I was kind of just going with it to get to that end goal, you know? I had four in total. Yeah. Well, I think it's important to note that people start and then decide that it's not for them, yeah. and then they restart because your life can change yeah. within different years, even months, mm. and so they, the processes are there in order for people to take yeah. that step back if needed. It's a really good discussion. Um, I know we're, we're running short on time, but I do want to touch on this because it's... Uh, been mentioned a few times, it has to do with are there any outside factors, other factors that can impact the age of onset, whether environmental or supplemental? Um, has there been known anything that can, that dictates when onset might happen or could be delayed? Um, so there's a lot of, um, there's things outside the hunter hunting and gene, called genetic modifiers that can affect things, but I think the question's more about environmental and, um, enrichment and, and things like that. Um, there's a lot of work now to look at physio or exercise and, and uh, yoga and things like that that can um, that seem to show some promise in terms of helping, whether that's been definitely tested in the sense that for doctors and scientists, scientists to say this is right, they usually have to have a certain type of trial that shows that, but it's not to say that we don't believe that these things help. Um, I think, I can't remember who said this yesterday, but um, Charles, um, uh, I think the healthier you are um, and all the th good things that w we all know we should be doing is gonna keep you healthier longer, if you, whether you got HD or not. So that's probably my perspective. Specifically, and she's younger than me, so she's not going to say it. Specifically, alcohol and drugs. Okay, so uh, I know it was St. Patrick's Day yesterday, Lauren. Um, I know. Well, I don't that have you're HD, Irish. so I might as well kill myself. I know that you're right. Irish. Um, I however, 
However, again, consider, you know, people are willing to say, oh, here's a pill. Uh, I want a pill, you know, um, to, to make sure that I can get a cure. Um, sometimes when people come into my office, I say, do you smoke? Uh, I say, do you wear your seatbelt? I say, um, do you have uh, weapons and guns in your houses? And I know that you know there's different cultural uh, decisions in terms of, of all of this, and I live in the south of America right now. Um, but it's aside from all of these things of you know, and um, and I think maybe Nando might want to talk a little bit about just in terms of the science. But I think it's really important, even though we don't know that yoga and meditation and mindfulness can be helpful, it's not going to hurt you. It's actually going to help. It's going to help all of us, whether we are, you know, caregivers, professionals, at risk, positive, negative, or anything. But please do think about, you know, yes, you know, it's nice to go out for some wine or have a drink or something like that. But just think about what that does to your body and your brain, especially the younger that you are. So think about not only the science and, and your genes and gene modifiers and, and clinical trials and drugs, but how you can take care of your body and your mind. Fully agree. Fully agree. <laughs> <laughs> fully, fully agree, absolutely, and uh, of course, uh, from from the side of uh, science, uh, I can't uh, add anything more than what Lauren said, and uh, of course, uh, physiotherapy, uh, physical rehabilitation, but anyway, any kind of uh, good. Uh, practice uh, and health practice might help, of course. We don't know enough about that, honestly. And uh, uh, what we uh, should hope in the next future is also to think about the cognitive rehabilitation, for example, and uh, everything is uh, uh, helped by new technologies that are now uh, starting to be proposed, uh, and there are so many programs, projects that uh, are in uh, in progress or next to start. So it's uh, a, a dynamic uh, moment, and we must expect to move forward about it. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Astrid. Yeah, I just wanted to add because I think we, of course, we need more research in in, in confirmatively you know, no, but I th to me it, it's, it's quite logical because HD is in your body from your inception and your body manages to deal with it in ways we don't fully understand yet. So to do all the things that are healthy and good for a body makes sense that it helps your body to deal with the hunting team, you know, uh, lumping and everything that's going on better than if you're harming your body with, with bad lifestyle. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> pointing at you. Um, I'm not going to say anything about that, Lauren. I'm just, I'm just joking. <laughs> There's been, um, I, th I think, when you look at statistics, they can be empowering and also sometimes troubling because you're taking a lot of averages uh, based off of data known. So can you speak a little bit about the... Uh, the, con the concept that a higher CAG repeat is directly correlated with age of onset and, um, and what the science is behind, if that tends to be true or is that a good predictive measure, especially when you're thinking of a parent who has a certain CAG repeat, the child has a different one, does that always mean that the child could be sooner onset or later onset if it's higher or lower? Go, go, go on. Um, I can show everybody a graph later of actual individuals and dots with age of onset and and their CAG repeat length, and we do see a trend. And when doc when scientists talk about trend, it's usually that line that's kind of representing the data. But each of those individual people, um, if you look at the most common CAG repeat lengths that are in the clinical population, it's around between 40 and, and 45. In that region of the graph, if you look at the age of onset, it goes from below 20 right up to 80 or 90. That's the variation that we have. And so if someone tells you that your mom had 43 repeats you're, and took onset at this age and says that you're going to get something similar, they're talking crap. It's not true. So everyone's different. We can just say 
as scientists, we look at things differently because we're looking for trends and patterns. But on an individual level, we cannot tell you you're going to get HD at this point. Um, we want to get better and better at predicting that. And things like genetic modifiers are starting to come into it to explain what's the other aspects of genetics that is actually contributing to that variation. But right now, for you as individuals, we can't tell you that, unfortunately. There is a trend, and as um, maybe Nando can highlight a bit more, as things get higher and into 60s or 70s CAG repeats, we know that mostly causes juvenile onset HD, and the variation is a little less in terms of age of onset. Um, but in the most common repeats that most of you will hear about, um, Unfortunately, we can't give you a more definitive answer. Yes, uh, just some, some, some uh, just to add, to, add, to add some comments. Um, <coughs> of course, uh, 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 there is a, a large uh, variation of onset per uh, CAG repeat when it is expanded in a given range, as Lauren said. Uh, it, it is a usual question that we receive in clinics. Uh, my answer in general uh, uh, is that we have general, uh, general answers and uh, some exceptions. The general answer is that we cannot predict age of onset, but we know that this is a, a disease where the age of onset anticipates compared to the affected part. Which means that it gets increases by generation or... Um, exactly. If exactly. you hear anticipation, and, uh, that's what this, that means. It depends, it not fully depends on the expansion, uh, on the intergenerational expansion, but it depends also on other factors, as Lauren said, including gene modifiers that are within and uh, with uh, and out of the CAG repeat stretch. So uh, it's, the general answer is we cannot predict, but we are aware that it is possible that the disease anticipates and uh, in, in, in offspring with exceptions. We cannot say more. Well, I want to give um, the panelists the ability to say one last thing before we wrap up. And then um, I, I think it's important to know that there are a lot of questions that didn't go answered. We try to cover some general topics, knowing that maybe it could answer some of the questions. But as you can tell, all of these panelists here don't like to talk to community members <laughs> at all. Just kidding, just kidding. Please feel free to approach them if you have specifics or want to learn more, because that's what this is about. It's about making those connections. You also have the app, and with their profiles, you can message them directly. Um, and then we'll be going through the app to questions that we didn't get a chance to answer and replying as well. Um, but thank you so much for submitting those questions, because these are all important points. But panelists, I wanted to allow you to say one final thing, if you would like to address the group. One thing to say to everybody to close. Uh, uh, um, <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, well, you have one. You can say one more thing to yeah, everyone before yeah, we finish. Sure. No, it's uh, um, a main message I would like to 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 to, to forward to all of you is that this is uh, in my, for example, in my experience, this is the first conference, for example, where each section is uh, speaking about the juvenile onset of the Huntington disease. So it never happened before. And uh, my opinion, this is also one of the first section, the first conference, where there is uh, a large number of uh, family members compared to researchers, of course, and the professionals. That is fine. I mean, <coughs> it is a great opportunity for both sides. So thank you for to be here, and a big thank to HDO <laughs> for, uh, for doing this. Yeah, I think I have to, I'll probably go home and I, I'll be like, oh, I should have said that. But uh, what I feel like saying now is really um, to thank you again for everything you do. Keep getting involved. Uh, reach out if you have any questions, either here or 
uh, outside. As you said, it's, it's a great, it's, it is a true community, so don't be shy, just reach out and uh, yeah, keep getting involved. Yeah. Yeah, I, I echo both of your comments. Thank you, HDO. It's just an incredible opportunity and experience to be here and to be sharing information together. Um, I think that is really something that is uh, a privilege for us indeed. And as, as Selena said, please come and speak to us. Um, tell us about yourselves. We can tell you about what we do. And just sharing that information, I think, is going to be incredibly powerful. So thank you, everybody. I just want to try not to cry, but I love everybody a lot. And um, you're all my extended family. Um, and thank you for making it even bigger. Um, I'm a hugger, so feel free to, to come hug me. Um, I guess I just want to say thank you. I'm really grateful to have been on this panel. I didn't really know why I was, but I am really grateful. Um, but yeah, my kind of advice is to use the support this weekend. I uh, just speak to people, get to know people, speak to an ambassador. There's many inspirational people in this audience um, who would be loving to talk to as well. But yeah, thanks. Uh. Be inspired, tell your story, and talk to yourself as if you're somebody you loved. Yeah, I just want to say, I went to bed last night, and I felt, I felt happy. I felt happy. It had been such a wonderful day, and I met some new wonderful people, and it was, it's so amazing to be here. And I think together, we are going to make, turn hope into urgency, as Seth said, and we are going to change hope into action. Thank you. I also went to bed last night. <laughs> a, a, different, a different bed. <laughs> At least I, I think so, I don't, I don't even remember. Um, but yeah, hopefully you remember what bed you were in. But uh, no, no, <laughs> hopefully you have a great time. I'm really enjoying this event and um, it's so exciting to see everyone here from, from all corners of the world. Honestly, it's so good. Um, and Carly, you do know why you're here. Yeah. You did the three peaks, superstar. You tested positive. You're so strong. Going into your therapy, you saw for studies. So good. You know exactly why you're here. So everyone, have a good time. And I'm also a hugger, so come and talk to me. Well, thank you all so much. One more round of applause for our panelists and our people asking questions. <laughs>